And so at this time, ladies and gentlemen, Lenny Bruce. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Pryor. Please welcome George Carter. Zen people, zen. Hi, I'm Kareth Foster for the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. And today at the Helium Comedy Club in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, we are doing something that has never been done before. We are going to have a conversation about comedy and free speech with the daughters of the godfathers of comedy. We are joined by Miss Kelly Carlin, Miss Rain Pryor, and Miss Kitty Bruce, the daughters of George Carlin, Richard Pryor and Lenny Bruce. Ladies, thank you for joining us today. Thank Thanks you for, for having us. Thanks for having us. How do you feel about this, actually? This is the first time you have all been together in one spot for an actual interview, together. What is happening right now inside? Uh, I think our heads are exploding. Probably, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> and my heart is beating really fast whenever we get together. Right. We can sometimes finish each other's sentences. sentences. It's like, <laughs> Hello. <laughs> it's like, it's epic. It really truly is. It's well, epic. when I first met Rain and Kitty separately, I, it just, time. but instantly, yeah. it's, a, I don't have a sister or a brother, I'm an only child, and yet I, these people understand my life experience without me having to say one word. We just understand. So mm, there's yeah. some, there's an incredible amount of comfort in that, and uh, shared experience, even though we had three very different lives. So, yeah, it's very cool. You, you spoke to something that most people can't. Your fathers were legends. They were pioneers in the True. world of comedy and free speech. So I'm curious, how has that led to your understanding of the role of comedians in the world today? Well, I think you should start with Kitty with that. I know, right? Because yeah. her so father first, started right, it all. Your dad, you, right. Yeah, your dad, your dad was like right. the godfather of the godfathers. Right. So, ladies and gentlemen, here is a very shocking comedian, the most shocking comedian of our time, a young man who is skyrocketing to fame, Lenny Bruce. Here he is. You might be interested in how I became offensive. <laughs> uh, like, started in school with... Um, uh, drinking and uh, I was really I was like a real depressed kid and, you know and at seven eight years old I really get juiced and get out of my head. and uh, so the teacher would really get bugged you know with with me singing and carrying on uh, and calling Columbus a fink and, uh, and and boosting Aaron Burr and all that I think that the role of comedy is to make people sit back and think and to reflect. The other side of comedy is simply to cause people to laugh. And usually it's because people identify with something that makes them laugh. I think, you know, it's, it's about truth and speaking truth in a way that make people think mm -hmm. and make them laugh and explore something outside of a comfort zone in a way that all of a sudden the audience feels like <sighs> you know and each of our dads I feel kind of were able to bring um, they weren't just one group our dads kind of crossed the line and bringing different groups together at a time that it wasn't supposed to be together and mm -hmm. I think it's because of that truth and mm -hmm. so that to me is what the comedy is about in the Trinity and I, I got lawyers and shit. You know, lawyers are some expensive motherfuckers. I got a lawyer. First week, the motherfucker bought me a bill for $40,000. I said, motherfucker, I just met you. And lawyers, they don't get upset, right? God damn it, why do they? Don't worry. Everything will be all right. <laughs> no, but I want to know why you got to budget. Take it easy. 
and you leave there feeling like an asshole. Right? You've been going, what the fuck am I yelling about? They come, I'm just facing 47 years. Yeah, I, I, I always think about what my dad used to say about it, which is that he believed that his job was to find the line mm. and to cross it. And I wanted to know the ones that you could never say on television. I mean, the filthy words that are always filthy. <laughs> All I could think of was <laughs> mother That was his whole job. And I know the reason why he worshipped Lenny and followed him around was because Lenny was crossing lines that no one, no one had crossed yet mm -hmm. except in their living rooms. He was talking about the things that people did not talk about in mixed company, nice company, and certainly <laughs> out in public. And, and I, so I, you know, and the thing about the problem with comedy these days is there's not a lot of lines left to cross. <laughs> So it's it's an interesting time for comedy because you know what what is the what is the edge what is you know what is that new vista we're all walking towards the culture is so permissive and allowing everything so therefore we get someone like Donald Trump running for president <laughs> and that is pure comedy right there that's hello except I don't know See whether to laugh one? or cry right. <laughs> See the next? I have heard that uh, lately from a couple different comedians that I know. One in particular, Margaret Cho. Margaret, yes. Okay, and audiences were booing her because of the content of her act. It was Jersey, though. I don't understand exactly what brought you here. When I thought about what's going on just in the climate period, is that people normally don't, when my father would perform, you know, you'd hear a grumbling and then, you know, whoo, and they just walk out. Now, in this generation, people are getting hands on and up, all up in that. And it's, it's, you know, she's a comic. And she's a funny comic, and she right. touches on a lot of different areas. But it just shows how the climate and our culture has changed. And it does involve what's going on in comedy and what's politically correct and what isn't. There's too much correctness going on. Do you think right. your fathers would have had the same reception today as they did back in their time? because of the climate now with this outrage culture that we're living in? Uh, well, I mean, I can speak because my dad was doing comedy in 2008. There's just enough bullshit to hold things together in this country. <laughs> bullshit is the glue that binds us as a nation. Where would we be without our safe, familiar American bullshit? You know, people who came to see him came to see him. He wasn't out in clubs like this, having to win over audiences. He had his audience. He, right. you know, he was established. Yeah, right. people like <laughs> saved their money all year to go see my dad every 18 to 24 months when he would come around into their city. So, you know, that's a luxury. But in Vegas, you know, where they weren't always his audiences. Usually, about a third of the audience would get up and walk out if he started talking about abortion or politics or autoerotic asphyxiation or something, you know. <laughs> Why? Uh, I, I can't imagine. But no. uh, so so he okay. was dealing with that. But that was usually older people who would walk out who thought they were going to go see the hippy-dippy weatherman and didn't really know who he had turned into in 40 years. So, um, But if they were coming up today... I, I think, you know, it's funny. As you were speaking, I, I, in my head, I was seeing my dad doing his stand-up. And I think in terms of, I think there would have been less diversity, and I think he totally would have had the Black Lives Matter movement behind him, but it would have been limited, as opposed, because he was so vocal on race and so vocal on the disparity and the inequality that, so I just think there would have been a line that wasn't there before, you know yeah, what I mean? Yep. Because I think in, in comedy now, what I'm finding, you know, is I find that now audiences are so divided because of this, Thing called political correctness you know it's like we're afraid to 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 laugh at at what is painful 
Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. We're afraid to, to go to that line and cross it. And then if we do cross it, we're not crossing it for the sake of enlightenment. Right. We're mm -hmm. now crossing it to say, fuck you. And it's, it's, it leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Yeah. Like the word pussy. <laughs> Figuratively. I want to ask you this because you touched on something. I, I'm going to combine two things that you just yes. mentioned. Vegas, mm -hmm. which was a turning point in both Rain, your father, and Kelly, your father's careers. They both had experiences in Vegas where they were like, you know what? Enough of this safe stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get real. And even, you know, in your father's autobiography, he talked about, you know, being more than happy to sell out to make some money, but he had to live his truth. What do you think was the trigger for that and why they couldn't go back? Why, why our fathers couldn't go back? To the same, like, they, they, their mission was to live in their truth. So why couldn't they go back? Like, the Vegas thing, why was that, you know, if, like, for our dads, why was that so important? Why was it important for Lenny? I think it was important, first of all, because it inhabited what my father was and what he said and what he thought. He got thrown out of Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And the reason he got thrown out was because Pearl Bailey was, uh, she was singing and he was very shy. And uh, she said, and then now, uh, Mr. Lenny Bruce, Mr. Lenny Bruce is in the audience. Come on, Lenny, stand up, stand up, Lenny Bruce. And my father's doing like one of these so he thought that he was going to do something <clears throat> funny. So he took a fire extinguisher and he was playing. The freaking thing goes off, goes all over Miss Bailey's <gasps> gown and everything else. <laughs> That's okay. Terrible. All right. And the, you know, the Tony the Fish and Jerry the Butcher guys. Okay. <laughs> it's time, you know, so he split. So wow. that was that. Wow. <laughs> That's an that was a unique story. experience. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting the visual of it too. Know, it's amazing. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I know that my dad was inspired by Richard, by Richard's turn. Richard made the turn first before yes. my dad, and and Richard was younger than my dad. So you know, but Richard had the balls first <laughs> to turn well, his he, back. I think he had the balls though because he had just finished hanging out with Huey P. Newton, mm. you know, yes. in Berkeley. And it's yep. like, once you hang out with Huey, yeah. you know, in a you can't go back. suicide, you kind of can't go back. Yeah. It's like you're either going to be the black man you say you are, Richard, or you're not. And I think, you know, and here you are in Vegas with a predominantly, I think, white crowd at For the time. For sure. That, that trigger went off in his head. Plus, you had, he was married to my mom, and you know my mom. You know, she's a white woman who thinks she's a black militant. Yes. And... <laughs> It wasn't going to fly even with her right. because, you know, she's she's hanging out with the Black Panther Party, feeding black children like because she really felt down and she still is that an activist. And so I think he had no choice. Yeah, that, that that's interesting. Yeah, because you know? for my dad, what was happening was he was hanging out with musicians mostly <laughs> who had who had all made the change. They were all speaking their truth there. You know, they were their insides match their outsides, whereas my dad, his outsides did not match his inside because he'd been smoking weed since he was 14 and he was basically a radical head, you know, hanging out with all these guys and playing along, playing the game. And, you know, once he dropped acid in 69, it really, and he dropped acid a bunch that year, it really, it was like, kind of his come to Jesus moment, which was like- Acid would do that to you. Yeah, oh, was yeah. like, oh, I really can't pretend this anymore. Mm. And he was still had a bunch of gigs that he had to do. And I guess he had dropped acid one weekend <laughs> and was doing the Playboy Club or something like that. And he, he was so bored and he didn't want to do his regular act that he just laid on the floor and described the bottom of the piano to the audience because nice. he was trying to get fired desperately. Wow. So and 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 once that turn happened, he he couldn't go back either. It's just it's one of those things where you you know the revolution is out inside of yourself and there's there is no turning back. How has that impacted your lives? Um your your view of free speech in America and and your your mission, like, do you feel responsible for carrying on that that legacy? Yeah, I, I, we were talking about this earlier about it's just in our DNA to be these people. And, you know, my dad, 
kind of had these daddy teaching moments with me where he would like make sure that I, I understood in the 60s especially. I was born in 63. So by 69 I was six, seven during all of that stuff. And um, you know, he, we, my dad went to do Kent State and we went with him and he took me to the memorial where the kids had been shot a few years earlier. You know, like my dad made sure that I understood what was going on. I was there at Summerfest when my dad got arrested mm -hmm. for saying the seven dirty words on stage. Mm -hmm. So it was a real, a real life day to day thing for me and it felt very dangerous to live the life we were living at that time. I mean, we were on the side of the freaks. You know, uh, Nixon was in the White House. You know, this was not an easy time to be different in this country. And so for me, I've always had a passion for it. I, I, you know, I think building on my father's shoulders, but also understanding that it is the marketplace of ideas. That whether, you know, whether you like someone else's speech or not, I will die to protect your right to say it because then I'm hoping you'll protect my right to say it too. And it's hard being an American and, and with that, you know, because you have to, you know, let the Nazis march, you know, through Skokie, Illinois and things like that. But um, without it, none of us have the freedom to, you know, to speak. And if you don't have the freedom to speak, then you really don't have the freedom to think either. So um, it's just... It's just, it's, it's part of my DNA, absolutely. Right. And it's definitely a part of mine. I mean, my dad, like I said, it's comedy is about truth. And so we grew up with the rawness of burying our souls. You know, as prior children, I would say sometimes maybe it's, it's almost like diary of the mouth. You know, we've, we've just learned how to bear who, who we are authentically. And I'm realizing in the world today, that's, that's so rare that people actually question the authenticity instead of welcoming that because we are actually, it's funny that we're talking about freedom of speech when I feel like everything is, is, is less freedom oriented in terms of our speech because I think political correctness kind of cuts us off at, at the knees and doesn't allow us to be our authentic selves. Every show that we watch is not about authenticity, yeah. it's about being other than who we are, when our dads were so much of who they are. You know, my dad was social media, your dad was social media, your dad was social media before there was social media. Mm -hmm. They put it out there on the stage for everyone to see, exposed in all their foibles, their, their grand moments. Do you know what I mean? And here we are today, and I, I think you're right, yeah, the Nazis do need to march through Skokie. Mm -hmm. One, for the education of it. I need to be able to show my daughter and explain to her what that means exactly. and what that's about, and I hope their kids get to see it. It's like the young man who on CNN, what's his name that spoke with the KKK? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, w. Kamel yeah, Bell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 he's you know, great. It's, it's like, I thought that was a great, it was a very great, teachable moment on both parts even if the wall was up and to me that is freedom of speech to me you know what i mean being able to say the you know whatever words we want to say but having the awareness of explanation the awareness of the authenticity of it is what our pops i think really mm -hmm. stood for and it's ingrained in who we are you'll never i've never mm -hmm. not been able to be Rain. I've tried for a moment because Hollywood <laughs> said not to be, but can you imagine? Yes, no. Right? Can you imagine me being a Kardashian? It would never work. We, 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 <laughs> when we first met, we were like, oh my God, we should do like a fake reality, reality show, show and give them exactly right. what, what they, they want. want. Absolutely. <laughs> because it would be so awesome to be those girls that walk in the room. Don't you know who I am? <laughs> you know, I'm Richard Pryor's daughter. Where's the Coke? You know? <laughs> nice. <laughs> people want to see instead like we're down to earth <laughs> yeah, totally. you know we're so much a normal part of lives who our father it's like you with with everything that you do will with you, Lenny's house yeah, and will you talk yeah. about that Kitty will you talk about what you what you're doing now in in honoring your father's legacy please share sure uh, <laughs> okay what um what I wanted to do was to honor my father's memory in a way that was going to change lives, not with the, not with anything dopey. No pun intended. And so, <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> Sorry, I had to point that out. <laughs> so, <laughs> I wanted I wanted something to change lives for the greater good. And uh, I had found that women 
in early recovery from drug and alcohol addiction, uh, either when they're incarcerated, either when they're just in an addiction, or in a treatment center, their minds, and this is for male and female, the minds, they don't know what to do with spare time, and they're used to being told where to go and what to do. And the people that needed help didn't have insurance. They needed, and there's exorbitant uh, costs for treatment centers, mm. places to, to go to get straightened out. So I took it to the next level because I wanted, to find, I wanted to put out there all the things that nobody ever told me when I got clean and sober. You know, I wish they would have given me a handbook. And so what I did was I went all over this world to Belize, to Paris, to here, and I took from each and every place the uh, modalities, the, the module of what I thought was going to help. So we opened Lenny's house. And uh, next thing I know, you know, there's, there's women coming in shackles and they're maxing out and they're doing their last six months for drug and alcohol crimes. The DA would put the mirror, drug court. And, uh, you know, and I purposely would bed the banker, you know, the, the head of the bank, you know, with the woman that just came in shackles. And what I had found mm -hmm. is that to explain to, to explain to a person who's suffering from that disease, they need to be, they need their brain scrubbed, okay? Everything has to change. And so what Lenny's House did was opened an opportunity and a platform for showing these women and now men a direction, how to navigate, and what to do with their minds. And we helped a lot of people, and we still do. We scholarship, it's a non-for-profit, and... Uh, so awesome. That's phenomenal. It's so good, it's so good. Speaking about the mind, um, all of your fathers, I think, can be considered geniuses. Yet, what's fascinating to me, from the research I did, I don't think they had a formal education past ninth, 10th grade, yet they were seen in the world as these incredible intellectuals. And they found homes in the university world where I think is where they really felt comfortable, ironically, and where they got to spread their ideas and their messages. How do you feel that things have changed from when they were doing it then to the climate on college campuses now? I think there's a huge difference. My father's favorite place to go to to perform was to college campus. He loved young people. When uh, the Lenny Bruce archives that are, being, that are donated to uh, Brandeis University, so the unveiling will be uh, October 27th and 28th. So now, I'm starting to find, I'm calling different comics and I'm saying, listen, can you come up and do a set for the opening? And, uh, and I'm hearing a lot of rumbling and, and um, I'm thinking, what's going on? Because I didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, Kitty, they want our comedy to be beige. Mm -hmm. They want beige, they do not, we are being censored. I said, you're being censored? What do you mean you're being censored? Said, yeah, they want to know what our material is. So now I'm hearing this and I'm, I'm having, I'm going, oh my God, this is a flashback. This is my father getting arrested for content and mm -hmm. using the law on, on um, a Puritan or anything that is sexually, this is, this is gone in reverse. What is happening here? This is a college campus. This is where ideas should be open. Censorship is big time. And then I'm, t then I'm thinking, wow, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. I thought about George Carlin. I saw him doing a clip. And, George, and this is where the idea popped off. And George was talking about that we don't have a choice in elections. It, like In other words, it's a done deal. And so I'm thinking about it, and I'm saying, well, wait a second. 
Our news is beige. And it's all spoon-fed to the American public so that we take our eye off the ball. Mm. And they'll lighten up the dark things to make it a prettier and shinier lie of a truth. So with that being said, it's, you know, it's handy to have an epidemic every couple of years, if you notice, because, <laughs> well, it's true. Every couple of years, you're going to have some kind of disease. Why? Because it takes our eye off the ball of what really is going on. Kelly, would you, would you weigh in? You know, it's really interesting, I think, about political correctness on campus. Um, this was a big issue in the early 90s also, is really when it started. It's actually when I was on, I went back to UCLA later at 25. And by uh, 91, 92, I was part of the communications department and I actually ended up doing a symposium on political correctness. My dad came and was a part of it because it had, it had just started to rear its head back then. And you know, he, here's the interesting thing about it. So political correctness is based on identity politics. It's about people wanting to claim the right to speak from their own subjective point of view. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a gay person, a black person, I'm a woman, whatever it is. It's all identity politics. It's all about I am this and this is my life experience. This is a really important thing for our civilization and society to be able to have that voice for all these oppressed voices to finally speak out and to define themselves. The problem that happens is that then it becomes about the thought police and that, you know, I want to define myself this way and I want to make sure that you define me this way too and you don't get to define me any other way. And that's when we get into trouble because now I'm controlling what you want to think and what you want to say. And yes, we can pretend that that'll make a better world because we'll all be pleasant with each other. But like we said earlier, if you don't know about the Nazis and who they are, then they become the hidden enemy. And people pretend that everything's fine and isn't it all lovely and daisies. And yet people are plotting horrible things in dark rooms. Right. So it's actually going backwards. And I think one of the most, I mean, I'm studying this thing because I talk a lot about it. And one of the things I love about what my father said about it was that, you know, it's about tolerance ultimately. Um, you know, identity politics is about tolerance. But n not tolerating someone's speech in service of tolerance, so intolerance in service of tolerance, does not work. Mm -hmm. And like we said earlier, it's about the marketplace of ideas. It's not just about me declaring, I am a woman, this is my perspective, but it's about learning to have conversation. And because of identity politics, we no longer know how to have a conversation in this, in this culture anymore. It has completely divided us between right and left, mm -hmm. and no one knows how to sit down, and that's why Congress does not function anymore. We don't have a government that functions, and that's why we're getting an election like we're getting right now. And everyone's getting more cynical and more turned off by it all. So, you know, it comes from a great place. Its intention is good as it, and is important for our culture, but shutting down what people can say and what their comedy is and making everything beige is not good for democracy in the end. And, I, you know, so I think we're going through a, some difficult growing pains around all of this stuff. And it will play out, you know, and, and it's, it's fascinating. I mean, I mentioned Trump earlier. This is why we got Trump. He's not politically correct. It is refreshing. He says what's on his mind. It's not pleasant to listen to. But this is America, you know, and, and politic, politicians don't speak. They become so beige. And we all sit there watching most politicians going, yeah, he doesn't really mean that. Yeah, he doesn't really mean that. Yeah, he doesn't really mean that. So, you know, it, it's, it's... Do you this... think your father would support Trump based on... Oh, who... God, no. Okay. No, 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 no. My dad would see him as for who he is, which is misogynistic and racist and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, he, he loved the freak show of it all because it Absolutely. is a real freak show. Yes. And, you know, he, he loved the freak show aspect of American politics. But, uh, you know, my dad didn't vote. He, did, he stopped voting in 72 when McGovern broke his heart. But, um, <laughs> you know, he'd be a saint. I know he'd love Bernie Sanders. But my dad was very progressive, you know. Um, so 
that that's but that's my take on it. You know that it's 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 an interesting mixing of progressive ideals with fascist tactics, <laughs> <laughs> political correctness in general. Yeah. So. In terms of like the whole college scenario and being able, you know, I think it again we're in a, in a different place than we were back in those days where it was, you know, it was shock and awe. We could say what we wanted. People like my father didn't have to be educated, you know, um, proper education, whatever. But they were great observers of the world and great commentators on that. And I think even to be great at what you do, even in on a college level, you have to be a great observer. Mm -hmm. You know, you go to the the guy who's studying medicine, you know, who's going to be the doctor, is cutting open the cadaver, learning about how to do the operation or how to know what's inside the body. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be a good doctor or a great doctor. Do you know what I mean? But it's all a part of the observation. It's all a part of the practice. And so our dads were of an era that allowed for, because no one had heard it before. The problem is everyone has heard it. So how then do you express this newness in a way when we are at a fragile point in our lives? You know, I think our country in general is at this very fragile, it's, it's like an infant, infancy all over again. So what information do we put in? What do we take out in order to be stronger and better? So at first it does become a little beige. You know, it, it does have that uncomfortable, like, can I say this? Can I not say this? Which why I think comedy, it, it's going to be interesting after the election to me to see what then comedy turns into, what our world will turn into, what kind of words do we start you using for ourselves? Like, what are we really commenting on now? What becomes funny now? Um, if that makes any kind of sense. Mm. But that's kind of where I feel like we're at from where our dads were at a time when you could be this. You could march down the street. You could get hosed. It could show up on the news, but you knew what it was about. And we told our stories orally. It wasn't all reflected on our, on our phones 24-7, which changes that because, again, it's the whole telephone thing. Yeah. You know, then it was different. Like we saw it, Uncle Marty saw it, then Uncle Marty talked about it, then we talked about it, but then we became a part of it because we were in it. I grew up in my, you know, it's like when I wrote a letter to the KKK and, and President Carter, it's like I could do that then. You know what I mean? Barely would my letter get to o Obama or whoever becomes the next. Do you know what I'm saying? It's a different thing to be careful with who we, who we are in in general, it has to go through this. We're going through this interesting, like I said, it's an infant. How do you think censorship affected your father's lives and careers? He almost died, and then he did. He was constantly, constantly being arrested for his yeah, act. In that time, yeah. For, the, for, for his content, it made people so uncomfortable that it, it came to a point to where, uh, and this is, this is hard to even, it's hard for me to even believe that something like this could go on. Because my father in the beginning, he was funny. Then he got really funny because he was hitting different ideas that people could relate to or shock people. Mm. He never used obs obscenity for shock value. Right. When they started to have cops come into the clubs and uh, a district attorney would say, um, Lenny, Lenny, you better bring your toothbrush, okay? And my dad started wearing a trench coat on stage because he knew, okay, that he was definitely going to get hauled off in one way, shape, or form. So the whole scene, the coming in with axes and busting up toilets because it's illegal to have a place that serves any type of liquid, you know, to have it has to have a working bathroom. Hmm. So now he's got cops on his back. He's got detectives, the LAPD 
and we don't even have to say anymore, the LAPD and Sheriff's Department, <laughs> okay, all of a sudden became his very best friend. Mm -hmm. And they just kept whittling and whittling and whittling away at him. At who he to was. To shut him down. As long as we can shut him down, as long as we can keep him quiet, for God's sake, don't let him talk. And as a result, we now fast forward. 2003, there were two men. One was a college professor, David, um, David Scover and Ron Collins. And there was a class. And their assignment was to try to get a posthumous pardon for my father because when my father got busted, his last bust, um, he was looking at four months uh, in jail mm. for talking. And so, and he died with that black mark on his, on his memory. So these young people got together, my father's favorite audiences, mm -hmm. and they put their heads together and they started a campaign. And they had these little buttons and it say, pardon Lenny Bruce. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Bob Corn Revere uh, was involved in that seriously, who was also involved with fire. And uh, next thing I know, there's this uh, a statement with a seal on it from the governor. It made history. It was the first time in history that anyone was given a posthumous pardon and the conviction was overturned. See, that's beautiful. That is beautiful. Is. Well, and what's amazing about that is that, so, my dad got arrested with Lenny in 62 at the Gate of Horn. My mother was there also. I told uh, Kitty the story earlier, which I just love the story, which is my parents drove from New York to Chicago to see Lenny. And um, they go into the club, and Lenny gets hassled, and then the cops start hassling everyone in the club. They're trying to find underage drinkers so they can shut the club down and punish the Gate of Horn for putting Lenny on stage. So Lenny's in the paddy wagon. The cops ask my dad for his I ID, and he declares to the policeman that he doesn't believe in identification. <laughs> my mother's rolling her eyes, basically. My dad gets thrown in the back of the paddy wagon with Lenny, and my dad sits there and proudly told Lenny what he has just done. And Lenny looks at him and says, what are you, a schmuck? <laughs> you know, which I just, I just love that. <laughs> but, you know, 10 years later, it's now 1972, and... Um, my dad's class clown album is, he's recorded it, but it's not out yet. And he gets hired to open for Arlo Guthrie at Summerfest, which is a big outdoor festival in Milwaukee. And he's on stage and he's trying to do his class clown material in front of like 20,000 drunk people, basically. It's not going well. He keeps saying to them, no, you need to listen more. <laughs> yeah. That, that'll work. Like that. <laughs> and, and so my dad's doing his routine, and, it, and it's peppered with language, and his routine is going out throughout the fairgrounds so everyone can hear it. The promoter comes up to my mother, we're, we're in the wings, and says to my mother, the minute George gets off stage, they're going to arrest him for language. And because the cops were watching, and they didn't like what was going on, and so my mom knew that my dad had drugs in his pocket. So she took a glass of water and walked out on stage to warn him to go off stage, stage left because the cops were over here and to try to get backstage so they could hide everything. So we, that happens, dad wraps it up. Oh, the thing is my mom comes out to tell him to get off stage. Does my dad just wrap it up? No. no. Oh, this is so. when he starts the seven dirty words part of the routine. Right. Of course. Go and, big or go yeah, home. Yeah, right, exactly. Go big or go home. And basically, we have the recording of this concert, and you hear him talking, and then you hear his volume just slowly going down, and they start to play music over him. And then he realizes, oh, the concert must be done. And he leaves the stage, and we're stashing we're drugs. Show. I know, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And um, and they did. They ended up arresting him. Uh, thank God, not for drugs. But you know, and he went to jail for disturbing the peace or something like that. But so there was a disturbing the peace charge. But they, you know, 
250 bucks to bail him out. And But we knew because of Lenny's arrest in 62, my mom knew when this happens, you get a First Amendment attorney, you get a civil rights attorney. You don't just hire any attorney. This is now a civil rights issue. And Milwaukee backed off and just, you know, let drop the charges and all of that. But um, yeah, so, and so it was interesting because it was still just the end of that era. I mean, it was clearly a different era. It was 72, people were marching in the streets and there was a, a lot of free speech issues going on. And, you know, so now the government in the time that we live now, the government isn't doing the censoring. It's now corporations right. and big media right. and colleges and universities, you know, and diversity groups, basically. And which is just such an interesting political spectrum because most of the diversity groups are very progressive and very left. And the rest of these folks are more on the right. So it, it's, it's interesting, we're, you know, we're self-censoring now, and you were talking about it earlier, this chilling effect, you know, um, I get it on social media all the time. I'm always thinking about how do I couch this? How do I do it? Because if you don't do it correctly, you get people from the left attacking you, mm -hmm. or you get the people from the right attacking or you. Your, or my mother. Or <laughs> Why did you say that? That could ruin your chance. I'm like, do I give a fuck? I'm speaking my truth, mom. <laughs> exactly. Well, and it, now we have the cloak of invisibility with the internet. Yes, you know? certainly. Right. Yeah, that, that doesn't help factor. things at no, all. Right. Yeah. Well, speaking of corporate censorship, your father had to deal with that at NBC yes. with his show. He did. He had. Well, that's why it only lasted what four shows. What five, happened? What, what, he. Well. Yeah, please he explain was, that was, to so, the people. You know, here he is on. He has his own show, Richard Pryor. He did four amazing that Robin Williams was in. It started the career of uh, Sandra Bernard. Sandra Bernard, right? Yes. Uh, Marsha Warfield, like you know, some great talents are on there and he so he comes out and they're like you can't do this you can't do that and they were always afraid of him by the way which is why saturday night live started the first five minute delay was because of dad you yeah. know because show. didn't yeah, he walk started, out naked uh, that was on his show <laughs> right. but it was in a That's suit I mean. he was actually I, yeah so that was part of it because he was saying fuck you which is why they canceled yep <laughs> i've given up absolutely nothing <laughs> I think that's so brilliant I because that's who, that's who he was. It was like, he knew, my dad wasn't stupid, first off. Yeah. Like, yeah, he was risky, but my dad wasn't stupid. So it's not like he was going to necessarily cross that line. Do you know what I mean? But it was that we still live in that. You know, we still have that delay. We still have that what can we... Again, what can we say? What can we not say? But now it's so in your face. We don't have the people who are willing to walk out naked. Yeah. You know, and be like, fuck you, you know, suck this. Like, we don't have, <laughs> lick this, I guess. For me. <laughs> 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 you know, we don't, we don't have anyone willing, necessarily willing to take that that risk because of the corporations, because of things running things. And yes, do we need to eat? Yes, we need to eat. But I think what is so interesting is I think, first of all, the, having a, the three of us here who are these very highly um, conscious, living in consciousness kind of women, uh, I think is, is great in terms of not only for, for what our dad stood for, but we are the generation of, we're going to continue to speak our truth yeah. up against that wall. Yeah. You know, I don't think I'd come out naked because I'm self-conscious, but if I wasn't, I think I actually would. Like, I don't give a fuck. And I don't give a fuck because of who they were, because I, those are the shoulders I stand on. And to deny that is denying my right as a human being, it's denying my right as as a woman of many colors, as a woman, period. Do you know what I mean? And I have to be about that. And I think you live that. I think you live that. That we are we are about going up there. We're not afraid to come against you know whatever it is. Yeah, and we, we will come with hard. We will come hard. You know, we will definitely come hard. Dad with had a an common FBI good. list. I'm not afraid of the. You know, I'm not afraid of the FBI. I'm not afraid of the police. I am. <laughs> I'm, not. I'm not because they are 
already know where I live. They know we're standing here at a helium. We're still here, right? Like, I'm not, you know. But wait. But wait. <laughs> you know, but no. it's, it's so funny, though, because, I mean. I'm more afraid of my phone when I go on Facebook and it knows I like a certain item. How the fuck do you know that? I didn't talk about that on Facebook. Why are you putting it there because for me to Because you Google searched ad? it earlier. Asshole. Flat Earth theory. I'm afraid, more afraid hmm. of that, of tracking me, than I am of a file on me for speaking my truth. Does that make sense? Yes, totally. What were you going to say, Kelly? I just, it's, just, it's funny that, um, yeah, I mean, because... I, because I think also because of my upbringing, I bring more of, uh, and, I, and I see it in my dad too, even though my dad was in your face kind of a person, he was a man who wanted to make sure he had a really logical argument and a reason to be in your face. That was his particular genius. Like he didn't do what Richard did, which was like unzip his soul and pour it out onto the stage, you know, or, or, or even what Lenny did, which was like, you know, talk about things that people were not allowed to talk about. But my dad would always make sure that he had like a backup argument to why he was talking about things. There was always this l incredible logic that he would use in his humor. Intellectual. Yeah, very intellectual. Yeah. And you, he would end up taking you logically to a, a premise where you were like, you wouldn't normally agree with it, but it was so logically and beautifully done that you're like, well, I guess we should turn all the square states into prisons. <laughs> you know, it's like, makes perfect sense to me now, you know? And, and, I th and, I, and it's interesting because I think I come from that school too. It's like, I want to like bring people, you know, my dad would talk about that line that he wanted to bring the audience across, but when he talked about it, he said, I always want to bring them in such a way across the line that when they get to the other side, the way I've gotten them there they have to stay there. And that's what I love to do, you yes. know? And, I, and, and that's how, like, we each of us can't help ourselves. No matter, like, what group right. I speak in front of now, I always want to figure out where is their slightly uncomfortable line and how can I bring the group with me in such a way because I'm speaking from my heart, but that when we get there, they can't deny that we're now over there. And that for me is the victory. It's like, right. oh boy, we made it across the line today, you know? And, exactly. we, and we truly cannot help ourselves. Do you think that's your way of kind of combating this? Because it seems like there's almost an unwillingness to, um, to explore uncomfortable topics now. It, it, people are so uncomfortable, they don't even want to go there. But it seems like you all have found it to be part of your mission and your purpose on this planet to take people there. Um, so do you think there's hope in what you're doing? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Completely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I told you. Yeah, because, because, because when you take them there, them. like in my How solo, you that? in my so, so, so what's her name? Come on. Who? It's Mavis Staples right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take you there. Yeah. Okay. So when I, in my show, what I do, my solo show, is I make people cry. Oh, my God. And people don't want to go there. I bring people into, into places of grief with me. And there is such an incredible sense of relief for people that I took them there. Mm -hmm. they, they pretend they don't want to go there. But we all want to go across the line because that's the enticement, whatever it is, even if it's the thing that we we're so reject as a culture or personally and don't want to see. But we know once we get there, it's like, oh, it's not as scary as I thought it was. And, you know, that's kind of my mission in life is, is to do film. that. It's like the horror yeah. film syndrome. You don't want to watch what happens, but you know at the end the killer's going to die. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like you're taking us. But, yeah, that's, that's what's beautiful. Yeah. About who... I think who they created and what, you know what I mean? And what our, what it's about is to, like Kelly said, it is about taking you to that edge and each one of us does it. And yes, like I said, there is a possibility for that to change because you have very, like I, I live in that consciousness. I don't, as soon as you tell me I can't, okay. I'm the person that's gonna be like, watch, <laughs> watch. Yeah. I'm gonna make it happen. Do you know what I mean? And I, because I believe it's, it's over there. So where do you think we are in this cycle of free speech and society? Because I think we all agree that there is like, the, there's a cycle to it, mm -hmm. right? Um, where do you think we are right now? I think everyone has free speech. They have these phones and everyone gets to speak right now. Everyone gets a say. 
Um, we've had these so the social media for about seven or eight years now. Mm -hmm. We're just starting to come to terms with the fact of how this is affecting our life. The echo chamber of it, um, the weirdness of Googling something and then it's up on your Facebook feed. Like the first time that happened when my husband was like, looking at something on eBay and suddenly it was on my Facebook. I'm like, what the? Um, th so we, we all have a right to say things and we're all planted in that right. But like I said earlier, we're not, no one's listening to each other. We're screaming at each other. Mm -hmm. We're, you know, yelling at each other. We're blocking each other. We're trolling each other. We're doing, but no one's conversing right now. So, you know, it's, it is this infancy thing. We're all kind of just narcissistic ids out there, all of us. And at some point, in order to make this world go round and continue going round uh, as, as a human society, we are going to have to start listening to each other again and, you know, uh, and, and decide how much of this little thing we want in our life. I mean, I'm about to go on a three-month sabbatical from my social media because I'm tired of the echo chamber. I'm tired of this deciding what I think about all day and what I'm conversing about. So... Uh, original thought. I'd like some of that back, please. And um, so I think it's it's an ultimate democracy in that we all have a voice, but there is something, you know, the difference between a democracy and a republic, you yeah. know, it's like we haven't figured out the republic part of social media, yeah, which is like, you know what, there needs to be some rules around this. And rules doesn't mean that, you know, it's unfair. It's that rules that are as fair as possible for everyone else. But we need to figure out some rules around this for ourselves individually and as a culture. So, but it's, it's exciting times, you know, and it's messy. It's really messy right now. Um, but there are a lot of amazing organizations in this country, like FIRE, that are working to make sure that people are educated about First Amendment. And, and the thing I love about this conversation and about our fathers mm -hmm. is that people don't remember the fight. People don't yeah, remember don't. that her father got arrested for talking about religion on stage. Religion, you know? It's an, it's, it's, it makes my head explode that we could go back there if we're not careful, right. but we're not there. We have moved on from that. But people, kids need, you know, young people need to know about her father and what happened and what happened in the 50s to shut, you know. Uh, Absolutely. And all of that. And, 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 then the, and then the evolution and how our fathers stood on Lenny's shoulders and how we all stand on their shoulders, you know. This is an important education and history is really essential around and this. And that's issue. another reason why people should read your father's books. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and see all of our father's material and read them. read their biographies and, and autobiographies. Right. And know who they are, know and the you, history. You yourself wrote a book called I did. A Carlin Home Companion. Yes, yeah, so my which memoir. Made me laugh and sob uncontrollably and <laughs> I do laugh that. again. <laughs> yes. um, people on the airplane thought I was completely nuts. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> they thought I was bipolar. <laughs> Um, but what, you know, how, how, share a little bit about your book real quick. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's the story, it's my story, uh, obviously, part of it's with my father and my mother growing up with them, um, and part of what I investigate in my story with my father is this concept of truth, mm -hmm. and that my father was a truth teller on stage, and was a hero as a truth teller, and yet we were a typical alcoholic, drug addicted family and didn't know how to speak the truth to each other. And that familial truth and intimate truth telling is much more difficult sometimes than being on a stage and telling our truth. And so some of that was part of the friction between my father and I later in his life. And, um, but it really is a story about love and our family surviving a hell of a lot and coming through it um, always, you know, with a lot of joy and a lot of love. But, but it wasn't always easy, you know, so, yeah. And you two, you wrote an amazing autobiography. Thank you. Um, and would you tell, share a little bit so, about that? Well, jokes my father never taught me, Life, Love, and Loss with Richard Pryor, isn't, was the book I wanted to write because I wanted to show I understood who this man, Richard Pryor, was. I didn't want to write the Daddy Dearest. We all knew about his stuff. I didn't want to write that. I wanted to write that I understood him, what he was like as a dad, what he wasn't like as a dad at moments. You know, um, also growing up being a biracial woman at a time that being biracial wasn't acceptable. My parents married, 
you know, four years after it was declared legal for interracial couples. I think the first couple was the loves, then came, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was a different era. And so my story is about growing up in this era, this black Jewish girl finding herself, finding her own voice with this iconic father who was known for his drugs as much as he was known for his brilliant you know, comedy in the world, and that I understood that brilliance. I also understood he was a young man. You know, he was in his 20s when he, he by that time he had three kids already, you know, at, at 20 and, and stardom coming at him, you know, um, so yeah. yeah. So that's what the book, you know, that's what it, it deals with. And also with my mom, understanding who they were as individuals. That was the story for me, and that's what my book talks about, because someone else is gonna write the other book. Yeah, right. Do you know what I mean? Right. That's not, I don't need to live that. And, and I think that, right. you know, part of what I got to tell too is that interesting cultural context that our parents yes. met in and what they were facing, and that incredible ride as an artist. I mean, all of our fathers had no choice in what they did. Yeah as we don't in what we do, but there, it's almost like you get on a train and it's going 500 miles an hour and there's no stopping it. And, you know. Silver Streak. Yeah. <laughs> One of my favorite all-time movies, by the way. And, um, and, and as a family member, you're getting on the ride also. Yeah. Whether you like it or not, yeah. you're on this ride with them. And, and you're going. And you're going. And your life is forever affected by that ride. And I think that's part of the story we got to tell is what that's like to be on the ride of that and then to figure out, hey, I need to pull the cord and get off here for a while because I need to go have my ride also. Right. You know? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. My train. And, and that's part of it. And, and Kitty, your father, I mean, Lenny Bruce's autobiography is getting ready to be re-released on the it 50th is. anniversary. It is. I am passing. very, <clears throat> I'm really, really proud and happy that it's being re-released. <laughs> This is my dad's autobiography. And it's a great title. Lewis, Lewis Black wrote the preface, a very hip jazz critic from the Chicago Tribune, uh, Howard Reich. And then we have Richard Lewis and Penn Gillette and different, different people sharing what they thought of the book. I wanted a whole new generation to get to know my dad. And when you read it, when I read it, sometimes I'll think, you know what? He's just talking. And I feel like he's just talking to me. So if I feel like he's talking to me, chances are that's what other people are going to feel like. And that's what he did in his act. Mm. He was very charming, very seductive very rhythmic and part of the proceeds of this book is going to the Lenny Bruce Memorial Foundation to help those who help, can't help themselves you know so ta-da <laughs> ta-da I love ta the title the like title is said, amazing Lenny Bruce how to talk dirty and wait and influence, influence, and influence, influence people, people. Yeah. people <laughs> which is the old Dale Carnegie right. thing it's just so fantastic it's brilliant yeah, it's brilliant truly so, is I, I want to wrap this up in such a beautiful way because this, this to me is such a phenomenal experience. I mean, to be sitting here with you ladies who are so in your own, you are your own spirits, your own people who are continuing with grace and with strength to carry on the message, the messages of, of your fathers, but in your own way. Um, what, how, how do you want to leave your imprint on the world? Oh, yeah, yeah. Put a foot up their ass. <laughs> <laughs> I, want it, I want to leave the footprint of helping the greater good. Right. Uh, to focus on letting people know. All we really want to ever know is, is that we're being heard and that we're ma we matter. That's really basically what all this fuss is because people just want to be heard. They just want to. They just want to hear that they matter. That's all. Right. And it's 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 not a. It, that's not such a big thing to do. Right. We need to have a kinder, gentler world. Right. That's the footprint, and I'll keep on stomping and keep on stomping. <laughs> right. But I'm sure the three of us together, 
Ooh, Lord. You know, for me, <laughs> I think for me, the, the footprint is to keep speaking truth to power. You know, I mean, that's, that's why we're here being interviewed for fire. You know what I mean? It's speaking truth, truth to power and to keep that. And I would say part of it, too, has to do with authenticity. And it's a word that gets batted around a lot. But there's something about um, taking off our masks of persona and being able to really see, see our humanity with each other. And, you know, that's what all of our fathers did, ultimately, was take off the mask of the cultural mask that was right. put on yes. all, of, all of us and say, look who we are really underneath. And this is what I think about all day, and this is what I'm obsessed with, and this is what we laugh about, and this is, this is who we are. And sometimes it's ugly, and sometimes it's messy, and sometimes it's beautiful, but we are all human here, and let's stop pretending. Right? Oh, you're gonna make me cry, because um, <laughs> I believe that wholeheartedly. What, what advice do you have for comedians out there today? Write it all down. <laughs> My dad <laughs> wrote everything down. <laughs> My dad was a note taker. Write, trust and respect your own thoughts and write them down and don't be afraid to fail. I would say, yeah, same thing. Write it all down and again, write from your truth. Don't try to be something else. Write from your truth, your experiences and go from that place and, it, and don't be afraid to fail because you're going to fail no matter what level you're on. Okay. I would think to be themselves, to be their own identity, and not to get swayed. And it's okay to have the eight o'clock spot in a comedy club. It's okay. And it's okay to have the 11 o'clock spot. Just to be authentic. But the I 1 a.m. sucks. Yeah, don't it does. Yeah, yeah, really, really that's sucks. pretty awful. You're doing it for yourself at this point. I think <laughs> to be authentic. <laughs> Enjoy oh, no, the by stage that time. Everybody's drunk in his minutes on stage. Exactly. Hollering. Exactly. Throwing Nobody bottles. wants that. No, uh uh. -uh. <laughs> Nobody wants that slot. Well, ladies, on behalf of the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, I. And as a comedian and as someone who is just in awe of all that your fathers have done and all that you are doing, I thank you. And I think we should give a really big round of applause to Kareth Foster. Yeah. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. 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 <laughs>